Number one, Ibble Dibble here. Hello, friends. Today, I thought it might be fun to talk about everything wrong with Megan's new brand. <laughs> Introduced on Insta two weeks ago now, she seems to have topped out at under 600,000 followers. And in a future video, I will get really into the analytics and how much she can earn through sponsorships, but that's not this video. I'm going to deep dive into the big picture issues before I get into the nitty gritty. I think we've all heard a lot about the fundamental problems with the nitty gritty. Ah, I certainly don't know everything about marketing, but I know something about marketing and that's more than Megan. This will be a multi-video series because I can't stop thinking of new things about this that suck. The first and most obvious sticking point, I think, selling almost anything is déclassé for a duchess. Even if they have a great product that people need and love and it does well commercially, it's a step down from gentlewoman rentier. I think there are three elements to this. There's the British element, the foreign element, and the female element. So let's start with the British factor. Once upon a time, no matter how rich, you could not be considered a gentleman if you derived income from anything other than rents and dividends. Anyone doing actual import, export, manufacture, distribution, they were always considered lesser than no matter how wealthy, unless they were officially raised into the nobility or managed to marry themselves up into it over many generations or both. Even financiers wealthy enough to bail out nations, Rothschilds, Astors, were considered lesser than until they got those titles. Obviously, different countries and eras have been different, but we're speaking about what is now the United Kingdom. For a long time, merchants could sort of purchase baronetcies, and if their family could manage to do this several generations in a row while building ever better social networks, eventually a king or queen recipient of a loan or favor, or on behalf of one of their thus obligated children, would raise that family to a hereditary title, by which point they were usually already in possession of a grand estate and house with lots of parkland and farmland, and well able to maintain a doomsday inheritor facade, even if that's not in fact how they made most of their money, and so on and so forth, generation after generation, as far up the social ladder as they could climb and their funds would permit. Of course, I'm talking about the back door into nobility. The front door has always been meritorious service to crown and country. And while many then and now decry the back door, a strong case can be made that without it, the nobility might no longer exist in the UK at all. The issue was a hot academic debate in the mid-18th century, with Baron de Montesquieu writing in the spirit of laws in 1748. Of course, I'm translating and paraphrasing, but not enough to twist his words. Quote, Neither kings nor nobles should engage in commerce since this would risk concentrating too much power in their hands. By the same token, there should be no banks in a monarchy since a treasure no sooner becomes becomes great, then it becomes the treasure of the prince. Commerce, sometimes destroyed by conquerors, sometimes cramped by monarchs, traverses the earth, flies from the places where it is oppressed, and stays where it has liberty to breathe. A monarch who rules arbitrarily or who rewards servility and ignoble conduct instead of genuine honor corrupts his government, end quote. He would definitely be a blockchain boy in 2024. And Abbe Coyer clapped back in 1756 in the mercantile aristocracy, arguing that the problem wasn't rewarding successful merchants with noble titles and high administrative offices. It was the consequent social expectation that once admitted they were members of an idle class with no true political, economic, or military function, a sort of domestic brain drain. So the correct solution for a nation to remain competitive would be to encourage the nobility to wholly participate participate in maritime, wholesale, and even retail trade. Obviously, there are many, 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 many more factors, but over the next half century, France went the Montesquieu route, Britain went the Quaye route, and we all see how that panned out for their respective royal and noble families. In my last video, I explained how the Groveners got their money. They're a great example. 
They're also a great example of how things really loosened up in the interwar and post-war years, whereas before it was considered most respectable for young lords and ladies to engage only in leisurely or scholarly pursuits. Their descendants were required to become quite competent quite quickly at agricultural management and property development at a minimum to avoid literally ruinous death duties. And with colonies peeling off left and right, military careers became both less esteemed and far less profitable, pushing even more Aristos into finance and industry. The spares had always been there, but now the heirs were too. Landed gentry became a status, a bloodline even, rather than a lifestyle. And ideas about clean, dirty, and murky money changed. So today it's acceptable, even expected, even considered preferable by many for peers to have real jobs. They can spend years, careers, talking other people's products and services, yet it remains sort of unheard of for them to market their own products. And it all goes back to that old social pretense to leisure. Of course, we've grown accustomed to house tours and gift shops and accepted that level of branded merchandise. Beautiful picture books, honey from their apiary, maybe a branded canvas tote to carry them home in, and a cap to keep the sun off your face while you roam the gardens. People really prize the one-offs. Once in a while, you'll come across a watercolor some elderly earl threw in his gift shop, or a baroness who genuinely enjoys cross-stitching brick doorstops or something and selling her handiwork. But the vibe is still very much hobby, gesture, memento, not enterprise. Of course, these people are very much invested in various enterprises, including consumer goods, but they do not lend them their face, name, title, or estate for branding. Why not? Because of the risk-reward ratio. Again, the Groveners, who I talked about in my last video, are a great example of this. Piles of ag tech investments, but your local weight rose is not flooded with Duchy of Westminster, Tempe Prosecco, and Lily Pond grass table mats because it would read as egotistical, domineering, down market, or worse. What if Wine Spectator gives the bad score? What if YouTube reviewers decide your perfume smells cheap? What if a party of school children gets food poisoning from some canned juice or something? What if your line of electric golf buggies starts spontaneously combusting? People with centuries-old names are not about to tarnish them with that kind of thing. Also, to state the obvious, not everyone is into heritage branding, especially considering heritage branded products are typically sold at premium prices. And in the UK, those who are, but don't have the time to do a lot of research, rely on the royal warrant system. Royal warrants are issued to suppliers, to royal households, personally approved, by the royals, and though initially granted on a five-year basis, can be pulled at any time for any reason. Poor quality, insufficient supply, any scandal, if the original founder or craftsperson dies or leaves the business, if the firm goes bankrupt, if the firm is sold, the warrant gets canceled. And rather sadly, warrant holders must relinquish their warrant within two years of the royal grantor's death. Even holders of problem-free warrants are reviewed by a member of household staff every four years. To quote the Royal Family website, quote, there are currently over 800 royal warrant holders. They represent a huge cross-section of trade and industry from individual craftspeople to global multinationals, ranging from dry cleaners to fishmongers and from agricultural machinery to computer software. There is no requirement for the company concerned to be British-owned or UK-based. Warrant holding firms do not provide their goods or services for free. End quote. Holding a royal warrant has become synonymous with quality and instantly confers heritage status on companies new and old. Permitting warrant holders to display the royal arms and legend doesn't leave a ton of room in the market for peers who might like to brand products they produce or promote similarly. I am not convinced most Brits rate or rank peers, and I certainly don't believe they would purchase consumables accordingly. 
Plenty of unaffiliated brands use the word royal and prince, princess, duke, duchess, not to mention crowns and tiaras and fake arms and shields and crests in their branding already. It's confusing. The Duke of Sussex with website dukeofsussex.co.uk is a pub in Waterloo. And it's not even the only one. The Duke of Sussex.co.uk is a pub in Chiswick. Which speaks to my next point. Setting aside reputational risk, heritage branding is simply not the right strategy for many products. For example, goji berries were first introduced into the UK by the third Duke of Argyle in the 1730s. I'd be very interested in buying Duchy of Argyle goji berry biscuits or scones or supplements or juice. I'd be googling to see if they were from old vines, if they produced on the estate or abroad, etc. I would not at all be interested in Duchy of Argyle toothpaste unless the Duke was a dentist. Well, <laughs> maybe goji berry flavored toothpaste for a guest bathroom if the packaging was as attractive as Marvis, but I can't imagine those would be really hot sellers. And I suppose the Duke can't either, because though he describes himself on his Wikipedia page as a sales agent, salesman, and company manager. Speaking to my last point, he doesn't sell things under his own name. In addition to renting out his various properties, for holiday home rentals, wedding and events venues, and filming locations. He's worked for 17 years for Pernod Ricard, promoting their 12 brands of scotch. He doesn't need the money. The Campbells are only half-jokingly called the Kings of Scotland, and his wife is a Cadbury chocolate heiress. So I guess whatever they pay him is truly too good to refuse. You know how they say polo is the sport of kings? This man plays elephant polo. Wrap your head around that elephant polo. <laughs> to be honest, these brands are nothing I would ever buy, but the King of Scotland must know something about scotch, right? And that's why no one reacted well to Clever Coffee or Newcom Patches or Travelist. As far as I can tell, Megan's never been to a coffee farm, Harry flies private, and both have a hard time maintaining composure. Why would they imagine their endorsement would boost sales beyond a single initial cycle of curiosity among their personal super fans? The only thing that could have been worse for them about those endorsements would be if they were branded with their names and titles. Duchess of Sussex Shroom and Herb Brew? The jokes tell themselves. Duke of Sussex Privacy Invading Tool Masquerading as Helpful Highlighter of Social Ills? I genuinely think he's too dumb to see it. At any rate, merely attaching a noble title to a product doesn't guarantee sales, especially where experience and competence hasn't been demonstrated. H&M must have already learned this through these personal experiences. That's what makes me think we're in for some truly lowbrow licensing deals, like Pierre Cardin level licensing deals. I'm talking about ballpoint pens, underwear. I genuinely cannot wait to laugh at at Meg's starring in the various promos. How low do you think they'll stew? The Sussex Royal shitcoin rug pulls? And because Archwell has been subject to such suspicion and derision, H&M don't have that standard face-saving safety valve to open. The I did it all for charity excuse. I don't doubt his good intentions, but that's really how the now King Charles was able to launch Duchy Originals in 1993 as the Prince of Wales and keep his hands clean through missteps, near bankruptcy, restructuring, corporate partnerships, and eventual corporate takeover, licensing deals, etc. 30 years ago, he was making cookies in his own bakery solely from ingredients farmed on or near the Highgrove estate. Nowadays, the original oat biscuit alone is a brand worth £115 million pounds a year and expects exported to over 30 countries, still qualifying for organic labeling but obviously mass-produced, which he collects annual royalty payments for. But from day one to today, all of his personal profit from the company has gone to the Prince of Wales Charitable Fund or its Canadian sister organization, 
Britain and believing small-scale farms are the UK's clearest path to economically and ecologically sustainable independence from food imports and a local bulwark against climate change. He funnels most of those proceeds into the Prince's Countryside Fund, specifically the Farm for the Future program. If he had never experimented with organic farming, local production, and doing it all himself with a really small team to start with, he wouldn't have the insight, acumen, standards, and expectations for the UK he possesses today. Archwell, on the other hand, is so thoroughly shady that even if H&M opened the exact same business but made no mistakes, the entire business was totally pristine, but they donated some or all of their profits to Archwell, that would be worse than not giving to charity at all. People would not only see it for the tax shelter it is, People would be afraid to buy from them. People would be afraid that their own money was being used to fund a war against their First Amendment right to free speech by a foreign royal who called it bonkers. It's really quite a remarkable scenario. Charles really drew the blueprint for H&M, but instead of following it, they're doing whatever this is. Okay, see you on the next one. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Um.